Hello everyone, today we talk briefly about late medieval trade, you know, European commercial activities, operators, um, trade routes, and uh, goods, naturally. We already talked uh, about this stuff, and this is part of our manualistic introduction to medieval Europe fundamentally. Today, let's focus on certain aspects maybe we haven't, th you know, framed before adequately. So, relatively to properly the commercial routes, right? The maritime once in a long run during the 15th century maintained a uh, prevalence, right? Uh, trade uh, fundamentally, but also communications in general, since fundamentally the 12th century, the, the, the second half of the 12th century were preferably on sea, right? Uh, land routes were also being implemented during the 14th century, as you see now, but uh, obviously the uh, the sea route was the, m the most convenient, right? You may think it was more perilous than land one, but actually not, right? It was uh, way uh, less uh, dangerous by certain, to, to a certain degree, and, um, and also way cheaper, way speedier, right? And and this is here where, where the protagonists in this in the 15th century are definitely the Anseatic fleet, Northern Europe, the Venetian and the Genoese ones in the Mediterranean and beyond we could say, and to cross the sea were ships vessels of you know fundamentally different typologies. Of course, at the beginning of the 15th century, the Iberian shipyards of the Atlantic coast put to, uh, at sea, the first caravels, right? That we mostly know because, of course, of the FOP of the, the great discoveries, the, the age of exploration. While in the Mediterranean, started to uh, affirm this mastodontic uh, cogs or carracks, let's say better, um, the, the, the evolution lines. We, we, we talked actually about these things in some other video. If you go in the Medieval Society playlist, you'll, you'll find about mm, novel... I don't remember what's the title, but... Uh, that, ah, there is, by the way, a playlist of novel history, so you can easily find that. We didn't expand more than much, so it's easy to find. That um, as larger ships... Na naturally, this had to do chiefly with trade, right? At this time, it wasn't properly like a ship designed specifically for war. Right, there, there were naturally certain adaptations, and th there was a, a, a proto distinction in some ways. But it's not until basically the 16th century, and unexpectedly in a country like Sweden, by the way, that ships were started being built specifically for a military use. Right, that from an engineering point of view really reflected something different. What had happened a bit throughout all over Europe, and especially in this major um, naval powers, that uh, shipped essentially enormous volumes of, of goods is that the um, the uh, naturally the hulls had to be larger right the, the larger they were the more they could transport um, also the more of course the the imposing the ship was in, in military terms we talked about the mood the, the the wars between the Venetians and the Genoese um, in the Mediterranean it brought to this great actually development not just of properly military technology but of the of naval, um, uh, of, of companies, also organizations. It's not just a, a military thing, but you know this idea that it was a, essentially a convoy, certain ac uh, escorts that would um, you know go alongside the, the main vessels. But the also main vessels were armed on a regular base, and the larger they became, especially naturally at the bottom for gravitational reasons, for maintaining the, the ship's stability. Well, this in favored the. Um, as uh, because of inertia, the mm, spread of artillery on ships, right? Because the recoil at that point could be better absorbed by the inertia of the mass of the, this enormous uh, quantity of tons of of, uh, of goods that were transported as well. So there was all a transformation that went in parallel, and naturally, larger ships required uh, more sailors uh, up to. Uh, you know, easily one, more than 100 at some point. Naturally, certain specific navigational skills, engineering capacities, right? The old thing, these were being developed, and to promote since the mid 14th century, this um, this phenomenon with this was the incrementation, of course, of the 
maritime insurance that covered both the shipwreck risks right and those deriving also from episodes of piracy it was still there right uh, since basically the 11th century Christian vessels had uh, dominated the Mediterranean right especially with the spread of of, of the peasants in the Genoese um, the you know the, the the Christians got the upper hand also the trade balance as you know uh, that means that Europe basically began to to treasure more precious metals than than what the Muslim world had previously done and uh, so but as you know by the 15th century the rise of the Ottomans uh, brought to the uh, increase in uh, insecurity also once again in the Mediterranean was split in half especially after the fall of Constantinople and this revived also piracy that had never ceased to happen naturally also in North Africa etc but you know with a much more conflictual mm, delineation of the various uh, relations that because before piracy had kept existing but normally you know Muslim and Christian ports were f frequented by everybody in that sense it wasn't much of a um, there was way more time of, of peace overall than than war also because the more war you make and the way more you need to recover and trade was drama dramatic importance especially you know metal and loans um, precious metals and loans etc that the polities of this time were chronically short of so especially these especially this for the Italians maritime republics were the ones more deputed there's not only them actually but they also the mm, terrestrial cities like Florence were connected to this to this enormous treasuring of of, of resources of money etc were used as loans and that helped properly this answering systems to develop and from their banking and this practices that spread European wide and that helped also in a sp uh, the result of philosophy about this in the you know history if you want even just more than a historical inquiry that you know by the 15th century this banking system in Europe was somewhat favored in, in, in terms of strictly capitalistic competition by the fact that Europe was politically fragmented right and this have helped also in moments of crisis like you know think about the Ottoman invasions and also the Protestant Reformation here this major moment of, of break of the, the, the universal unit the um, you know the the sectorialization of capitals in specific areas that means you know even if one you know countries wiped out say Hungary I don't know a lot of stuff would flow into into Austria to Poland to Venice and some other places that could be uh, this is kind of a positivistic view of the thing of course but it objectively worked like that and it, it stimulated on the markets in this uh, financial systems uh, a, a much greater a sense of competition that refined also the, the economical um, vitality that entities like for example the Ottoman Empire did, they don't really have right and also certain areas of Europe the Byzantine Empire hadn't had it um, Eastern Europe did quite have it um, and uh, th there are different realities in this sense but um, Th this helped uh, this prevented a stagnation that is typical of many other uh, contexts that you know tend to, to to break down as this colossal empires and instead in Europe the political fragmentation helped dramatically um, into this um, together with lots of other spin-offs because in the 15th century the Renaissance is born thanks to the banks right never think that you know humanistic stuff is to, is poetically romantically detached from think no Europe had the Renaissance because Europe had banks right and that's the sole reason why it happened right and naturally the banks are the the, the consequence of much else so it's obvious that we can't be categorical but it, if there hadn't been banks let's put it in this way it would have been the Renaissance and vice versa in some way um, at least in the way we know it right and uh, where do you think all those you know un uncountable work works of art from from these period from the 15th through the 16th and, and beyond a century comes from it takes a freaking lot of money right I also wanted to say something else but I don't remember what it was so <laughs> anyhow and um, yeah so answering, so this went in parallel actually with mathematical development, as you know. This um, there was a frenetic. Ah, yes, this is what I wanted to say. Actually, is that the 
bank the bank system in Europe had dramatically stabilized and uh, you know structured after the, the big crisis of the 14th century right that had struck deeply at, at a financial level right that was the first thing to jump so 15th century companies were way more um, let's say um, uh, they, they had much less risk by a certain standard um, we can't say properly that in absolute term I mean that in relative terms it was true but um, you know even just if you look at the sheer size of these companies what happened is that greater companies as, as had absorbed in parallel uh, and in absolute terms more wealth than had ever been seen right if you take the Medici as the greatest bankers of the period you see that um, they had at that point more money than I don't know if any European privately had ever held, right, in that sense, but the the wall financial traffic, traffic, for example, Florence, at that time, the 15th century, Medicine time was n not even close to the one it had had before the 14th century crisis, right? So it was a much more structured system, much more sophisticated um, during the 15th century, as you know, think about diplomacy, the ambassadors are being born as professional permanent figures, for example, there is this territorialization, this idea that also after the 14th century crisis, we have seen it in our video, that the universalism had collapsed and this, say, national regional policies had began to emerge as more stable, more steady um, entities that would structure themselves most locally um, and not trying to form a, a greater over rule, right? These are the times. Right? Another underestimated period, uh, excuse me, the topic of this time is um, river trade, right? River trade since, you could say, the Iron Age, but even before, you know, in the great landmass of continental Europe had been a, a big deal, right? Um, we're talking about rivers, channels, as well, um, that preserved throughout all the 14th and 15th century, possibly even increased, actually, their importance, their incidence, um, because, as we were seeing before, as far as uh, comparison, uh, water, land, route are con co connect, uh, concerned, the, fir the, the, the first one is way more convenient. So, it was easy to transport stuff on these major waterways, and we're talking about these major rivers of Europe, like the Thames, Severn, the Seine, the Loire, the Rhône, the Rhine, the Danube, the Spree, the Elbe, the Po, the Tevere, the Arno, right? All, all these major rivers that uh, so the, the rise also in this point was in previous times naturally of major centers um, in in, uh, in Europe to which the, the greatest also capitals and cities of Europe were, were connected. Famously enough, you were talking about uh, London, about Paris, uh, Vienne, Cologne, Rome, um, Milan, Right, and, and also, like many other cities that were fundamentally, if, even if they weren't properly on that river, but were connected to it through channels. Think about, in fact, uh, you know, the, the Netherlands, the, the Po Valley. Um, think about Rome with the Tiber, of course, and um, those great rivers in Spain had uh, maybe less importance objectively than these ones we had listed, but still were part, regular part of the economy in this context and naturally connected also to major other routes. I mean the idea that you know basically with, through the Rhine from Switzerland you could, ar could arrive to Norway right in, in the North Sea uh, that from Salzburg or Vienna you could get to you know to, to, to Constantinople basically in the Black Sea uh, I mean crossing obviously the Bosphorus but getting there in the first place, and naturally uh, many other. Think about the, the Rhone. Naturally, it connects the Mediterranean to Central Europe. Uh, these were major waterways uh, connected to very often with extension to maritime routes, like in the case of the Rhone or the or the Po, and so on. And so, for what the um, was concerned, of course. Um, there, there was a lot of business revolving around even just the transportation from a from a bank to another. You know, this uh, had always existed historically in these areas. Um, for example, uh, a great 
great benefits in the Po Valley uh, derived from the widening of the nets of the various channels, the Nabilia as they were called, so this artificial um, tracks that um, you know were, as we were saying before, expressly created to connect the city to to the river. And also, th there was during the 15th century never greater increasing uh, of the c improving the condition of land traveling uh, as well, land transportation, both because of the extension of paved roads in some areas, um, but also the ever more frequent employment of wagons, right? That conferred to, to land movements ever more, you know, effectiveness and security, right? Certain Central European areas were developing very interesting nets in that uh, part. For example, uh, between um, Bavaria and Venice, there was a, a very important, uh, important alpine um, highway, let's say, that had also, that we, maybe we have said it in other contexts, but during the crisis of the 14th century, were new, uh, new ways that were implemented, especially when traffic in certain areas became more more dangerous throughout all the Hundred Years War, for example. You know, French the French routes underwent a pretty serious uh, crisis, as you can imagine, so this would need the opening of some other ones. Uh, also, the uh, Champagne fairs declined, others road, uh, rose elsewhere, and so on. And the the improvement, however, of the properly of the road system was still relatively l scarce, generally speaking. If you look at the you know the history uh, in broader terms, still it was improving. By the mid fifth century, the typology of products of the international trade and the dimension of certain commercial volumes, let's say fluxes. Albeit not having really changed from the ones that we have seen her from a century before, and we've seen it actually in other videos. However, changed in some relevant ways that deserve some attention. So, in the textile field, it's important to highlight that the 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 affirmation of cotton and silk products destined to the wardrobes of the of the elites fundamentally the increasing production of English clothes, right, with the consequent mm, important drop in the wool exports, right, that was increasingly used by local manufacturing. As a consequence, the, the, the two big countries that did with this were, uh, that worked with the, with the wool exports from England, had, as you know, historically were Flanders and Italy, right, and therefore these so you know, we're obliged, uh, because of it, to draw ever more largely from other sources of wool, and specifically of the wool of the Merinos ship of Spanish origin. And we made actually a video about this, too, um, that uh, is about transhumance in late medieval Europe, right? And we talk specifically about the Castilian wool, Right, that was an enormous business. We're talking about millions, millions of beasts that, that were used in this business, because Castile, you know, this is the moment in which I mean, since the 13th century, the the Castilians had conquered all the, this enormous stripe of southern, uh, the southern Iberian Peninsula that arrived up to the Gibraltar Strait, and for centuries, the, the all the this huge lands in, in between in the in the Iberian Plateau had remained mostly a frontier area because the Christians and the Muslims were always mm, raiding on each other. So what happened is that transhumance rather than agriculture had developed so that basically, you know, in the, in the time, uh, you know, so the, the, the shepherds could, could get away in time before the storm came. And this, as a consequence, had produced this enormous amount of sheep um, that began to export in this period like crazy. It was always a great period of civilization also in the in, the, in growth in the we, we've seen in the um, we've had a media about this in the political and institutional set of the Iberian monarchies another important part um, of, of this production existed in southern Italy um, in both cases the sovereigns used to the literally the, the shepherds to as as communities to counter the the power of local barons Right, and giving them privileges, so this also increased the production of wool. 
and open new connections, new, new trades. Um, Safran of the Abruzzi and especially of L'Aquila in the Kingdom of, of Naples um, was an also um, certain part of the uh, central uh, and southern French areas too um, uh, among the coloring substances that were spreading uh, as well and costed a lot because color dyeing costed normally a lot it was mostly for um, elite products or you know luxury products um, for what the cereals are concerned the trade of grain was maintained uh, at the end of the Middle Ages among the, the most mm, uh, likely especially in the Western Mediterranean and strong remained in fact also the exports of wine towards northern Europe uh, both through the Atlantic uh, ports uh, and for connections with the Mediterranean trade All right. and of the artisan products ever more requested were the weapons and armor produced in Lombardy and in Nuremberg Right, these two areas were seeing the, the major development you know, in uh, military technology, in many ways. Uh, as you know, the uh, um, Milan and Brescia had been, historically speaking, the, the greatest um, iron industries in, uh, you know, weapons exporters in Europe. Right, they had a kind of pro-industrial system of function since the 12th century. Um, and the weapons mostly uh, in, in, of um, the just you know, being exported in this case came, we can't trace them historically speaking because there were properly these marks we know that came from, from the Lombard um, armories that were very regularized by the 15th century, so hence the Milanese, famous Milanese uh, armor. But so by the, the 15th century, certain areas, especially connected to princely governments or this could sell to princely governments were becoming ever more powerful began to rise the most important center being southern Germany right where the so-called gothic armor uh, began to spread as well right Nuremberg being the most important center there were also others um, spreading think about Innsbruck or same London began at some level but there were other you know the, the usually the Italian exports prevailed largely if you, during the 15th century, if you look at the War of the Roses, most of armor was Milanese, right, or was, you know, in, in Italian imported. In the case of England, by the way, there was a, a, you know, a chronicle problem of metal imports. In fact, also throughout most of the 16th century, most of guns, you know, you know, some of the most technologically advanced stuff came from, usually from uh, Flemish imports, right. But that's another story. Um, also because England was faring, um, you know, after the end hundred years for you know particular situation but um, the variation of the commercial uh, fluxes let's say induced to important I mean substantial changes also in the maps of fairs of regional scale let's say that maintained their importance also in the period of affirmation of the great mercantile societies great mercantile companies and also the partial sedentarization of the operators. This is important because I mean fairs had existed ever since you know certainly uh, you know since ever this Bronze Age it's great agriculture but mostly connected to agri agricultural production that however had seen this important decline by the 14th century for systemic and non-systemic reasons and Besides the decline of the Flemish fairs, it is to signal the growing fortune of the one of Brabant. Right, it was a meeting place of English, Dutch, and Anseatic merchants. Right, and during the 15th century, Antwerp became uh, an important emporium. Right, the first, uh, the most important one. Right, and gra and greatly at, at the expenses of the more, you know, traditional in this sense. Um, Bruges, Brugge. And a great development. Had, so, this is important because it's properly that certain areas also in the north, uh, Flanders, that are gaining importance, will become also historically what uh, the era of the you know, United Provinces, uh, that we will see now the, the rise of uh, places like Amsterdam or Rotterdam, 
right? That up to this point hadn't counted much compared to Bruce or Gant, etc. Um, and a great development had also the fairs of Geneva. There were four during the year. So this is interesting because we're, there weren't just one thing, right? They went on for throughout all the good season. And um, that uh, the Geneva fairs had their golden age, let's say, uh, around the mid-15th century, and they were largely attended by Milanese, Florentine, Genoese, and German merchants. Afterwards, the Geneva fairs had, however, to deal with the competition of the Lyon fairs. Right? Uh, this is the time in which France uh, emerges uh, victorious from the Hundred Years' War, so reconsolidates this dramatic uh, power with the unity and further expansion. Also, towards the, the north, it's toward Flanders, by the way, that, historically speaking, that's what all the French had, technically, was at least one of the directions the French had uh, historically taken to expand, so that's also what co caused, in part, crisis. And, and Lyon, that had been, uh, you know, famously this very important crossroad, a bit like Strasbourg in our context, not dramatically far, but, I mean, from essentially Mediterranean and Central Europe, right, that's the point, um, began as a major center, Lyon being a, a very important city, is still being today, for, in spite of the, you know, the, what would happen in the following centuries with the gradual centralization of the French monarchy in Paris, right, so um, this also is a, a witness to the importance of the city. Um, and, in fact, uh, Lyon was backed by the French king, right, they, they had the extra help uh, against um, Geneva. In fact, uh, the competition between Lyon and Geneva became uh, a, a true and proper commercial war. At the beginnings of the 16th century, Lyon, um, as uh, Faucon uh, says, quote, it was one of the greatest commercial uh, squares, uh, commercial and financial squares of the West. Mm -hmm. And as in the case of Geneva, a great part of its success was tied to the market of um, of the exchange and of silk, right? So from the mid 14th century to the end of the 15th, we also witness a blossoming of commercial activity in the cities of southern Germany. As we were saying before, we've seen this uh, important um, connection, especially with Venice, and also the uh, emergence of this local armory production starts becoming very important. Generally speaking, southern Germany has remained, you know, the, the richest, right, and most developed area, also from, from previous centuries in general. Um, the southern German merchants were organized at this point in, in very dynamically. In, in particular, we have these great names of the Fugger in Augsburg that built their fortune uh, very wisely, citing to the com long-range commercial activity, right? They they even competed successfully with with the Anse, right? Um, the banking run and the one also connected to mining and metallurgy, right? Uh, what normally happened, also how many companies at this time were emerging, including the Fuca. Um, was this uh, credit activities, let's say, but uh, more properly they were usually um, compensated by monarchs for which mostly most of the loans were ex about war, right? It had always been. Um, but um, as you know, in that case the Habsburgs were chronically short of money. A everybody was, but the Habsburgs weren't faring better than others, and therefore instead of cash of liquidity, they were compensated by subcontracts. Right, which included the exploitations of mines, right, of uh, and also the the connect the, the next uh, activities, right. Uh, this happened fairly frequently. The subcontracting system had been I don't know. Think about the Paleologans with the Genoese. The Genoese basically reconquered uh, with their fleet the the empire to the Paleologans, receiving in exchange all the uh, subcontracts of this various. Greek islands from which they, they got, for example, as we'll see now in a while, Mastic, Alum, uh, etc., that they, they start having a monopoly on, 
In that case, it was probably a military occupation. In the case of the Fugger, it was just, you know, very good business at a, at a civilian level, essentially, but still deeply involved in political, politically speaking. Also, in the same, and they, as you know, they will become fundamentally the, the, the bankers of the Habsburgs, right? Um, until they will go bankrupt, because of course, you know, that's what also, you know, wars were fought, there was no way, most of the times, to do dramatic pictures to compensate those who had, and, and the figure eventually declined. That's where the, the Habsburgs, and especially the Spanish crown, will go to the house of St. George of Genoa, that in the, in the latter, you know, during the Renaissance, will take the place of the Fugger. We'll see it in a while. And even those lost, you know, <laughs> consistently, but still gained uh, elsewhere. In that case, with Genoa was very different, because the Fugger were like private people, uh, becoming ever more powerful, etc. But for what concerns the House of St. George, when we think about the House of St. George and the bank that it was, fundamentally, we think about Genoa, like they are literally the same thing, the city, this company and the bank are one thing all. And in the second half of the 15th century, the commercial activity of the Anseatic fleet also kept deploying you know, with force, right? Um, and also to this were side ever more uh, vivaciously, let's say, the um, English, Dutch and Britonic uh, navies as well. The English merchants, especially, they began their competition with the Ansa, both in the Baltic and in the North Sea, up to determining basically a, um, um, a true commercial war that will end with the Peace of Utrecht in 1474. This is very important because what starts happening towards the, the end of the Middle Ages in Northern Europe is that the, um, you know, this greater systemic systemic growth of Europe required ever greater resources on an ever larger scale. Russian grain from Novgorod, from the Baltic, starts being needed in countries like uh, like England, like, like the Iberian Peninsula. So there is there are this bit the, 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 the northern route becomes ever more profitable uh, in many ways and the Hansa had become hostile, you know you know, that th there was this inherent conflictuality between the Kingdom of England proper and the Anseatic League because uh, the the Anseatic had this dramatic commercial power. You know, there were many little cities here. There wasn't like a major center like you could see in certain city-states like Genoa or Venice that could, there were, you know, state army bank, but uh, only one company, only one. These were many um, and they they had always blackmailed England by saying something like you know if you do not make us a good price it's, uh, to even just one of our cities all the other cities will essentially do something against you so the power here of the Ansa is decreasing actually because uh, the more we approach the Renaissance and the more the 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 general political institutional weakness of the Scandinavian monarchies decreases. So the answer will remain actually even a military power. I mean, they sacked Copenhagen, and they had a dramatic naval power, but the, when the, the Scandinavian monarchies will start building fleets on their own, like Sweden, and other, the, the, the thing will start decreasing. Also, powers in, in, continu in, in Germany will start becoming more powerful. So slowly the answer will remain. This main city is still... Um, you know, becoming very prosperous centers still today, right? Think about Bremen, that is kind of a state on its own in Germany still, and they say, you know, we are truly, you know, one of the most in the longest independent realities in the world. Um, and uh, but their power overall decreases. Will remain very important centers. Uh, not surprisingly, actually, will be the Netherlands that. When it, with eventually with the Spanish, the rebellion against the, the Sp you know the Spanish in at the end of, of the of the 16th century will gain that political unity properly as a country at that point. These were areas, in fact, that during the 15th century even the Burgundian government had cons gave properly up, uh, tried to homogenize the administrative political system, gave to to Flanders broadly meant um, kind of a national compaction, right?
that will be useful paradoxically also in the Habsburgic um, inheritance uh, for to, to to remain actually detached from the Habsburgs in many ways. That as you know, they they inherited the the, the Burgundian legacy of the of the Flanders, but it's not that these people actually like the Habsburgs at all. Nor the Austrians, nor the Spanish. Really, just of course, like good merchants wanted to remain on their own. Um, but that will evolve also with something more more importantly. So, and that will also escape. Will be the only secession from the Holy Roman Empire, for example. Historically speaking, the United Provinces. This is also you know, something much later in this. But think about it because it's important in perspective. It's, it starts beginning here. So, England also starts having enough um, centralization, especially with the rise of the Tudors and so on, uh, after the War of the Roses that had, you know, that decapitated the the House of Lords and, um, you know, being actually ever more now powerful against the Huns as well. And in the Netherlands, it was actually the uh, strong growth of the textile industry to give a spirit to the country economy with the consequent development of the portable cities of Amsterdam and Rotterdam, as we were saying before. But it was, however, in the Mediterranean um, that uh, remained tied up to, since the, the, the 14th century, the, the major trade routes, uh, I mean, notoriously, uh, and also the major banking and financial activities, right, and the, the, the ones that had a greater specific weight and um, vitality. It's not just Italy, traditionally, but also Spain, Barcelona, Valencia, uh, Palma de Mallorca were all, uh, at this point, the protagonists in the Iberian Peninsula, also with a, as you can imagine, a evident prevalence of the first, Barcelona being the uh, the major, the most important city in the Kingdom of Aragon and the, the port proper, you know, and, and the one that had in fact also contended to the Italians, the, the, the Western Mediterranean, seizing Sardinia, seizing Sicily, and uh, before Sicily technically, then Sardinia, and then uh, Naples. Exactly, Naples would be conquered in the 40s of, of the 15th century. So it was a, you know, think about this lands all together, was never kind of a solid, compact reality. These technically were all different kingdoms, but they were profitably and cleverly managed in this still uh, confederal sense that the Kingdom of Aragon had maintained. And, um, and, and naturally, Barcelona especially was the true mover of the of the commercial policy of the Crown of Aragon. And the initiative of the Catalan merchants spaced from southern Italy to the Maghreb to the Atlantic and reached up to England, Bruges, um, Antwerp. And there is no doubt that uh, in, however, that in the trade with the East was still, of course, Venice and Genoa to maintain a marked hegemony, right? Venice, um, after the fall of the Mongol Empire and, uh, you know, afterwards the, the, the Ottoman expansion that also caused to her the loss of Ovoya in 1470, right, uh, had to consolidate his presence in the areas of Mamluk dominion, maintaining with, um, in, in the meanwhile, also with Crete, an important stronghold in, in the Mediterranean. Genoa also actually had, Genoa had, um, because of the Venetian-Catalan alliance, had kind of lost its uh, major role. Uh, I mean, it, it's not nobody had up to that point had ever had it but you know in its prevalence in the possibility of prevalence in the eastern mediterranean proper all right but as we have seen the house of saint george um, was this state within the state or better it was the state was one of the pillars of the economy and the families of the highest aristocracy we're talking about the doria the spinola the justiniani uh, 
directed the operations, right? And so it was a very private business. Actually, Genoa was never like a, a state like Venice, for example, that had a very solid centralized, like Republican, but government. Uh, Genoa was ruled basically still in the old guilds, in the old, um, you know, quarterly fashion. That is to say, every one of these families controlled one part of the city and all together tried to and, and it was a much less functional system than Venice but nevertheless it was still quite effective from an, economy, an economical point of view um, also uh, around the house of St. George gravitated uh, a myriad of uh, small and middle um, loners right, uh, of the house that were properly the economical backbone um, of the Genoese society and Genoa however maintained as we we're saying also in, in the Eastern Mediterranean still very important um, strongholds and also in, in Black Sea famously enough in northern Turkey in Crimea all right um, and the from the east they got mostly especially the Mastic and from Kios the Alan right this gave a strong impulse to the Genoese trade in the Mediterranean, continental Europe, so much that um, actually Kiev specifically remained for Genoa a uh, reference point. At, at this point, the last in the Aegean, technically, even after the fall of Constantinople in the hands of the Turks in 1453, because, by the way, as we were saying before, trade was also like uh, continuing. Like it's not that the Ottomans invaded it and fought with everybody. Of course, they were mostly trading with each other uh, every time. This was the Venetian problem. It was would be a problem also in the 16th century, especially when the the Portuguese and uh, the Spanish opened the, especially the Portuguese opened the, the the route with the you know circumnavigating Africa, so they could get spices from India and the far far east Asia without uh, passing through the Asian land route. So this damaged both Venice and the Turks that at that point, you know, if they were losing too much, they said, okay, let's stop fighting. Let's cash a little bit more so that a trade goes more smoothly. The Ottomans also fought bitterly in the Indian Ocean, as you know, with the Portuguese later time. But that's also another story. Um, and of course, after the fall of Constantinople, a lot of things changed anyway, both for the city of St. George, um, for, for Genoa, I mean, and the, the, fort, the fortunes of which were tied, let's say, both ways to the Black Sea and the Aegean, the northern Aegean. And um, as for other protagonists, European protagonists of the uh, mercantile epopee of the East, was opened a phase of uh, withdrawal with within the horizons of Western Mediterranean, the Mediterranean Sea, especially. Um, but for Genoa, this also was a phase, uh, surely not without dynamism or success, right? You know, it was characterized instead by the emergency. Uh, also on the coasts of uh, Mediterranean Africa, Buja, Bona, Algeria, Ceuta, and Atlantic one as well, as Safi, Saleh, Marrakesh, and so on, of markets of, let's say, a resupplying and distribution destined to mark in a non-irrelevant uh, way the commercial history of Europe. In fact, the Genoese presence in, in let's say North Africa but specifically northwestern Africa, even Atlantic Africa, is something you know, it's definitely overlooked. It's something older than um it started from the twelfth century, if not even before, and it aimed actually at the gold of Senegal, right? And uh, so this all these connections therefore through the Sahara and, and other and the, the, the surrounding areas. So the wines of Italy, the silk of Calabria and of Valencia, the sugar of Sicily, um, of Algarve and of Granada, dried fruit of Spain, the skins and hides of Maghreb, um, all um, substituted the eastern products, right, with the loss of this 
border areas of the Eastern Mediterranean in a net of tropics that animated the Atlantic routes towards uh, the Netherlands, England, but also the major markets of continental Europe. Iberian cities, merchants and producers benefited largely of, the new, of this new context, as you understand, because, of course, with half a Mediterranean kind of engulfed, the, uh, you know, the, the importance of, of, of Spain, of the Iberian Peninsula, and of this broader sector in between North Africa, the Western Mediterranean, the Atlantic, Northern Europe, was, you know, placed down the center. Sevilla, Gades, Lisbon, in Portugal, acquired um, a role, you know, first first uh, rank in the commercial sphere even before actually the age of the great discoveries and actually this was a factor that triggered the same right because th without the capitals of the of the Iberian monarchies that now were investing um, uh, nationally speaking in, in expanding the markets in the Atlantic uh, trying the circumnavigation of Africa etc not even all that uh, you know, all the, the the personnel, the resources, think about this broader area of the Western Mediterranean, Catalan and uh, Italian sailors, um, cartographers, explorers, um, would have not had a properly a place to, to work in, right? And, and that's, this com it's this combination of factors deriving also from this shift, but paradoxically triggered, definitely. Uh, this is broadly speaking, notorious. I mean, the fact that the, the, the Ottoman invasions brought, pushed the Europeans to search other routes further um, uh, and, um, you know, to, to open the Atlantic ones fundamentally. All right, so this was it. And um, we you can compare this with other videos we made on medieval trade and seeing a bit how, you know, the different perspectives work also in di from different times. Pretty much sure we made a video on on the fourteenth century. This is a bit the, the consequent the, the the second part of it, right? All right. So for now, we stop it here, and I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time, and see you next time. Bye.